Hi, this is Jeff Heaton. Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with Washington University. In this video, we're going to look at ensembles. We're going to do, in particular, heterogeneous ensembles. This lets you take models that are not of the same type and combine them together for even stronger results. For the latest on my AI course and projects, click subscribe and the bell next to it to be notified of every new video. Now we're going to look at a couple of techniques that might be very helpful to you for this semester's Kaggle competition. This allows you to use neural network with ensembles. Ensembling is a very important aspect of Kaggle. This is where you create heterogeneous ensembles. Now ensembling is something that's built into many machine learning algorithms such as random forests. Random forests do ensembling just part of itself. It includes trees and these trees are ensembled with each other. Because there's not multiple different types of model in this, that's referred to as a homogeneous ensemble. Now we're going to look at evaluating feature importance first. This is a good paper that talks to you about how to do feature perturbation ranking. This is a very popular technique that can be used across any type of regression or classification algorithm. It does not use any internals to the actual model. This is also an interesting paper because it has both Dr. Joy and Dr. Death in it. Interesting part about the names of the authors of the paper. These are some of the other methods that you can use to evaluate feature importance, which input is the most important. Now this is dealing mainly with tabular data, where you have columns like you would see in Excel. If you're dealing with image data, feature importance is a lot more difficult to really determine. It's not like one pixel is more important, say, than another pixel. This is also a paper up here that I was involved in where we published code that could be used with TensorFlow to implement some of these algorithms up here. So this is a function that just introduces Produces and gives you a basic perturbation ranking algorithm. I'll go ahead and run it so that it's loaded. The way that this works is actually pretty simple. I have a separate video that's not part of this course, but it's a video that I put together on how perturbation ranking works. I'll put a link to that so that you can access that if you would like to read up more on the internals of it. But essentially what this is going to do is it's going to go through each column of the data set and shuffle them one by one by one. We're gonna use the same neural network to evaluate all the columns, but we're gonna score it once for each column. So say there are 10 columns in your X, 10 predictors. You wanna know which of those 10 is the most important. You start with the first one and you shuffle those, you perturb them so that column one is randomized. That effectively destroys column one, but the max and the min, the standard deviation, the mean, the median, and all that is still exactly the same. So you're not introducing any sort of bias, but yet you're destroying one of the columns. Now you evaluate the error on that neural network producing predictions with that column randomized like that. If column one was not very important, then the score is not going to drop much your accuracy or your log loss or whichever one you're using. If column one was very important, then shuffling it is going to really, really hurt your score. So that's why this perturbation rank, it's essentially looping for I in the range of how many columns we have. We make a copy of the column because we're about to shuffle it and we shuffle it, effectively destroying it. But we have a copy so that we can, we don't want to be like a tornado laying a path of destruction across the countryside. We want to restore it and not be a tornado. So then we look at if it's regression. If it's regression, we do a prediction on this and we look at the mean squared error. If it is a classification, then we predict the probabilities and we do log loss. Both of those give us an error that we want to minimize and we keep track of our errors and then we restore the column that we previously destroyed. We determine what the max error was and we basically calculate the importance of each of these relative to how close it was to the maximum error. The maximum error, the column that resulted in the maximum error is the most important column. So the most important column is going to have a 1.0 for importance. All the others will be some proportion of that. We're going to run the iris data set through this, the decent sized neural network. Well, that just fit it. So we have a model now fit for that. Then I'm going to get the accuracy, which 
perfect accuracy, not hard to do with the iris data set, and I'm going to run it. And you can see basically the importance. So the petal length is the most important column to predicting what iris you're dealing with. And then it drops considerably. You will only know which column is the most important. You won't know how important the most important column is. You just have a ranking of these. So you'll never see anything higher or lower than 1.0 for the most important column. We can also do this on regression. We'll use the miles per gallon database because that is a pretty simple one. You can apply this to much, much more complicated neural networks. It will take a little bit longer to run if you're doing this on your Kaggle because you might have 20, 30, 40, 100 columns and it needs to run across each of those. Now after running this we can see which of the various fields are most important to the miles per gallon neural network. We can see that the displacement which is just the cubic inches or some other volume of measure for the engine is the most important. Next is horsepower, weight, year, so on and so forth. Cylinders would be already represented by the displacement, so it's not too surprising to me that that is a less important one. But you'll notice most of these are pretty close in terms of their overall importance to that. Now we're going to take a look at the biological response data set that is provided by Kaggle because I'm going to use this as an example of how to build an ensemble. If we open this one up, I'm not going to do it, but I have a link there that you can look at. It's basically got nearly 1,700 columns and maybe 3,000 or so rows, so it's got a tremendous amount of columns. Feature importance could be useful to maybe remove some of those. Unfortunately, most of them are pretty important. What we're going to look at here is how we can combine these into a ensemble. And by these, I mean several different models like neural network, random forest, gradient boosting, and so on. So I'm going to go ahead and run this, which will essentially open these, these files. I have them resident here on a local drive. These are Kaggle files, so I can't actually put them in a place that would let you access them, you need to download them yourself from Kaggle. I just put them in a data directory. You can really put that any location you want. And I run that. You can see here when I print out the shape of this, it's really a fairly square data set, which is, which is difficult, where you've got nearly as many columns as you do rows. 3,700 rows, 1777 columns. So let's go ahead and we're going to run this, fit a neural network on this, and get some predictions. This is a classification neural network because it is basically telling us if a biological response happened or not. You can see that the validation log loss is around 0.55. Log loss is what Kaggle is actually using for this particular one to rank it. The validation accuracy is around 76%, so not good, not horrible. We'll look at the feature importance for this one. It essentially, most of these are in the 90s, and even past into the 1700s is also 90, so they're all important. So that is very difficult with this particular one. Ensembles were very critical to getting a good score for this one for the actual Kaggle competitors who worked on it. So I am going to start by just introducing some code that I have here, and you can use this to build up an ensemble. You see here I have code that builds a artificial neural network. I'm gonna go ahead and run this because it takes it a little while to run and explain what's going on while it is actually running. This builds the artificial neural network. I am giving it a number of, of classes here. Typically you'll want, this is really just placeholder code, you'll want to put in more dense layers than I have here. I also calculate the log loss, multi-log loss, that's a type of error calculation that we saw earlier in the modules. And the stretch code here is basically used to normalize the the y ranges that are predicted. So it's a, it's a type of averaging or normalization to stretch it out. This is a technique that I've seen in a couple of Kaggles. I copied it from one of the winning solutions here. You'll want to look, if you're doing a regression or single classification like this, it might be useful to you. I am going to use the stratified k-fold. Basically that is making sure that each of our folds 
are balanced in the same way that the training set is. Otherwise, you might introduce some inconsistencies. If you have, say, 20% positive in the overall training set, you want 20% positive in each of those K-folds. Otherwise, your ground truth is going to be off. I have information on the stratified K-fold in the previous module that talks about how to do cross-validation. Here we have a list of models. And these models, these are all the ones that you want to ensemble together. So I am building an ensemble of the Keras classifier to, we call, we basically build that artificial neural network that we have up there. Random forest classifier, a couple of types, and also extra trees, which is a type of random forest, and then also gradient boosting. I loaded my data sets and I run across all of these and build up the ensemble. I have other videos that I'll link to that get into really the mechanics of what this is all doing. Overall, what is happening here is it's building up a data set where each of these model predictions is one column. So since we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, we have seven of those, you're going to essentially have seven columns. The Y is going to be the real Y from the data set, whether the biological response happened or not. And you're essentially training a linear regression across all of these. So using the outputs, the predictions from all of these classifiers to predict what the actual output would be. You're using these models as inputs to another model, which is the ensembling model, to form that prediction. Then we blend it together. We're using logistic regression to do that. It's a type of linear regression, and we build that fit based on that, and then we finally build our prediction file based on the output from that linear regression. Here you can see we're basically going through all of the folds on each of these various model types, and it continues. At the end, it will give you the final submission file that you will actually send to Kaggle. Thank you for watching this video. In the next video, we're going to take a survey of all of the hyperparameters that make up neural networks and see how you can better optimize those. This content changes often, so subscribe to the channel to stay up to date on this course and other topics in artificial intelligence.